record. Okay, yeah, so yeah, we're ready. So uh, I think we're ready to introduce the speaker. Okay, so we just passed the equator of our conference. And starting the second half, our speaker is Maxime Fairon, uh, who will speak about non-commutative Poisson geometry and integrable systems. Okay, so thank you very much for the introduction. And let me also thank you, the organizer, for this uh, nice workshop, because it's really cool to be able to do, uh, let's say, uh, introductory mass in some way, uh, which is not directly losing us after five minutes. So it's good to be junior for that. Uh, okay, so uh, my idea today is to introduce non-commutative Poisson geometry. Okay, so it has to deal with double brackets that you may have heard about this morning, but I will introduce everything uh, you will see. And basically, I will spend about 15 minutes playing with this uh, non-commutative notion of Poisson geometry because I think it's really fun uh, and you can really play with it. And then for the last 10 minutes, I will explain the relation to integrable systems and I will build on that uh, during the parallel talk. Okay, uh, so let's start. So what is the motivation of this uh, non-commutative Poisson geometry? Well, the idea is to follow a principle formulated by Konsevich and Rosenberg, which is that you would like to introduce on an associative algebra like this one A, a non-commutative structure such that when you look at the corresponding representation space, okay, so the moduli space of all representation of A of some over some fixed vector space of dimension N. So just think of matrices uh, representing the elements of A, which are N times N matrices. You want under this mapping to recover a usual notion. So in my case here, I will be talking about a Poisson, uh, a Poisson bracket basically and some uh, associated structure. And then I will also build on that to try to introduce uh, some non-commutative version of integrable system, but you will see that it's not really complete. Okay, so yeah, let me stress again that really whenever I'm using a symbol with some indices on it, you just need to think of it as being like entries in a matrix representing an element of the algebra in some representation of the algebra. Okay, so how can we understand a non-commutative notion of Poisson bracket? Well, the a setup to understand it is just to think about a space M parameterized by some matrices, okay? So that the corresponding coordinate ring is generated by the entries of these matrices. And let's assume that the, there is a Poisson bracket on M, which is extremely nice. Okay, what do I mean by nice? That whenever you take the Poisson bracket between the entries of one of the generators and the entries of another generator, this thing will be given by just two entries of two matrices, which are just, a, let's say, polynomials in those generators, okay? But look here at the important way the indices are placed, okay? So here there is a matrix C, okay? Which uh, depends here, the first entry is the first entry of the second matrix B. The second entry of C is the second entry of the first matrix A. And then D depends on the first entry of A and the second entry of B, okay? So let's assume that all the Poisson brackets are like that. And then the question is, can we, in terms of symbol, understand this Poisson bracket? And there is a trick to do that, okay? So because uh, this uh, C and D are just depending on your matrices A and B, let's just consider a tensor product of these two matrices, okay? And let's just understand that if we look at the KJI L entry of this tensor product, well, we basically just get the Poisson bracket, okay? And so let's just look at this tensor product, okay? So this is what I'm denoting with this double bracket. This is just the tensor product of the matrices which are uh, giving us the Poisson bracket of A and B. And now is the thing uh, that I want to emphasize. And if you are not sure, you will listen to the rest of the talk. Just take a screenshot now because it's really fun to do this. Just try to translate what are the properties of your Poisson bracket in terms of this double bracket, okay? And so, for example, you will see that the anti-symmetry, well, basically, when you want to swap A and B, okay, you will get a minus sign. That's kind of obvious, but you also need to swap the two elements in this tensor product. Okay, so this is something easy to do, really. I encourage you to do that if you don't know what to do, or maybe this afternoon or in a week's time. 
Uh, but you can also write the Leibniz rules in terms of these matrices. And here, uh, let me just say that here, if we consider the Leibniz rule in the second argument of this double bracket, well, you will be multiplying on the left the first argument, and you will be multiplying on the right the second argument. In particular, when you look at this with the anti-symmetry relation, you get a Leibniz rule in the first entry, and you see that now you are multiplying the other element. Okay, so there is something there. And obviously, if you have a Poisson bracket, there is a Jacobi identity that you can also understand in terms of this double bracket, but let's not look at that because it, it's a bit more complicated, so not really difficult. Okay, so if you understand what I've said, then you will understand what I'm doing because now I will just be playing over an associative algebra instead of a ring of matrices. And this is the work of Vandenberg about these double Poisson algebras that I will now use for a few slides. Okay, so uh, just some really important notation. If I consider an element in the tensor product of this algebra with itself, okay, then I will uh, several times write this element as just being a the element prime tensor second, okay? So this is a kind of strong switchers notation because all the operations that I will do are linear, so I don't really uh, need to be extremely rigorous and write the sum because everything goes well. And also there is this two one two, which means that you swap the two elements in the tensor product. You also have a multiplication on this uh, tensor product, but what is now important is that if we now just take this, uh, double bracket that I introduced as a motivation on the previous slide and just consider the corresponding rules, cyclic anti-symmetry, auto derivation and inner derivation. Now as a map from the two copies of the algebra to the algebra tensor with itself, well, we get a structure which is called a double bracket. Okay, this thing is the non-commutative version of an anti-symmetric bi-derivation, which you will see in two slides. But if you are interested in a Poisson bracket or the non-commutative version of it, you still lack some kind of a Jacobi identity. So how to get it? Let me just write it down without going into the details. But just to motivate it, if you have a usual uh, Jacobi identity to check, you have a Jacobiator, which is basically obtained by using twice your Poisson bracket on a three elements that you are cyclically permuting. And this is basically what is happening with this operation on three elements. Okay, so here this is why an associated triple bracket because it depends on three elements. But basically, let's just see that it's really just using two double brackets on three elements and cyclically permuting them. But because remember that a double bracket is an operation with value in the algebra tensor itself, you have to be careful and know which element you will tensor. And so, for example, when you apply the second, uh, here, double bracket to the double bracket of B and C, you will just apply it here to the first argument of the double bracket of B and C. And then you do the same, you just have some uh, anti-symmetry rules to uh, uh, check so that everything goes nice. But what is more important is to say that this thing is a version of a Jacobiator, and we say that a double bracket is Poisson if this operation vanishes. Okay, so this is kind of expected. And as Two nice examples. We have first, when you consider a polynomial ring in one variable, you have here a double bracket of an element with itself, which is, as you see, non-zero. Okay, so you may say, well, with a with a usual Poisson bracket, you would expect the Poisson bracket of an element with itself to be zero because of the anti-symmetry. But here, because you are also swapping the two factors, this is not happening. Okay. Uh, and here, the second element, uh, the second example, it's a kind of non-commutative version of just a symplectic, uh, uh, the, the most trivial uh, canonical Poisson bracket, because you just have two uh, generators in your algebra, and they pair together to one, okay, or a one tensor run, because we play with value in the tensor product of the algebra with itself. Okay. So this is the notion of a double Poisson bracket, and why do we care about that? Well, basically because of this proposition of Vandenberg, which tells us that if an algebra is a double bracket, then the representations of this algebra, the n-dimensional representations, okay, so remember this is the space which has for coordinate ring all the matrices which are n times n and which satisfy the relations of your algebra. This thing has an anti-symmetric bi-derivation which satisfy the rules here given by equation three, okay? So let's just look at what this means, okay? 
So here, this is saying that if you want to evaluate the Poisson bracket of the IG entry of some element A and the KL entry of some element B, so just again, think of these as being matrices representing elements of your algebra, then what you have to do, you have to compute the double bracket here written at the top, okay? Because it's in the tensor product of A with itself, it has two parts. And then what you do, you look at the matrix representing the first element, you take the KJ entry, okay? And then you look at the matrix representing the second element and you look at the IL entry. That's a very simple rule for computations. And as a, another part of this proposition, if in particular your double bracket is a double Poisson bracket, you get with this rule number three, a Poisson bracket on all representation spaces. Okay, so this is nice. And as a, an example, let's look at what I gave uh, on the previous slide on the, on the polynomial algebra in one generators. If you just uh, apply this rule given by equation three to this double bracket, what you get here is just your KKS Poisson bracket on GLN. Okay. And from my point of view, this notation is really convenient because you don't have indices. That's why for me, this is really strong. Okay, so this is nice. And this gives us a first dictionary, which tells you that a double bracket is in some way the non-commutative version of an antisymmetric bi-derivation using that rule number three, and the double Poisson bracket correspond to a Poisson bracket. So we could do integrable systems here. The problem is that nice integrable systems, and by nice, well, you will see what I mean, uh, usually different radius spa phase spaces, for example, phase spaces obtained by Hamiltonian reduction. So what can we do here to kind of fix the problem? Well, the idea is that uh, Vandenberg showed that there is another property that this double Poisson bracket has, is that, okay, look a, uh, after the lemma, if you take the double bracket of two elements, you get an element in A tensor A, you can multiply that, okay, you get just an element in your algebra, and then you can push that in this H0 of A, which is just a vector space obtained from A by just putting all commutators to zero. And the fact is that under this operation, you get a Lie bracket on this vector space, okay? So why is it important? Because this vector space has some geometric meaning, okay? So let me use the notation that curly X of A will just mean the matrix representing A, okay? So really the matrix representing A, it's IJ entry is what I was saying, this uh, symbol AIJ, okay? So in particular, because we have a matrix, we can take its trace, okay? On representation spaces, and this is GLN invariant. Okay, wh what is the action here of GLN just by conjugations on all the matrices representing elements in your algebra? Okay, so this is basically there to change basis on the vector space CN on which you are acting. Okay, and why is it convenient? Because this coordinate ring is in fact the coordinate ring of this GIT quotient. Okay, so in this talk, everything will be very nice, very smooth. So just think of this as being a nice orbit space. Okay, this repayant modulo, uh, the GLN action by conjugation. And what's happening is that Vandenberg tells us that the operation this Lie bracket on the top, in fact, uh, describe the Poisson structure on the reduced space when you consider GLN orbits. And the formula is extremely simple, okay? So if you want to understand what is this formula, so the trace of a matrix representing some element A and the trace of a matrix representing some element B, the Poisson bracket is given by the trace of the matrix representing this commutate, uh, this uh, AB, which is just uh, this map. So you evaluate the double bracket and then you multiply the two components together, as simple as that, okay? So this, this pushes a bit more this uh, dictionary between the commutative and non-commutative worlds, okay? So as you see now, we have this uh, Lie algebra, which is governing the Poisson bracket on this uh, reduced space of orbits. But there is something a bit more interesting to do and it has to deal with Hamiltonian reduction. Okay, so le let me just put uh, this slide and leave it with you for five seconds because this definition of a moment map I think it, it's pure genius, it's so simple. It, it's very nice. And <clears throat> as you would expect, so this definition of a non-commutative moment map will be the non-commutative analog of a usual moment map, okay? So here, uh, what 
is this definition? Well, it's just telling you that a moment map is an element in your non-commutative algebra such that the double bracket of this element with anything is of the form this anything tensor 1 minus 1 tensor this element A. Very simple. So just by writing the double bracket, you may clearly see already if you have a moment map. OK. But why is it so important, for example, to do Hamiltonian reduction? Uh, because if you know apply the multiplication map to this identity, you see that on the right hand side you get a minus a, which is zero. Okay. So in particular, this uh, will induce that the Lie bracket that we had on this uh, vector space a modulo commutator written here on the top, this Lie bracket in fact descends to the uh, vector space now obtained from this a lambda. Okay. So a lambda is just a original algebra where you quotient it by just putting your moment map to some uh, complex value lambda, OK? And then you take you look at the corresponding vector space obtained by putting all commutators to 0, OK? And so proposition, again, of Vandenberg. This uh, equation 6 was the same in the previous slides, slide. So in particular, it means that the uh, to understand the Hamilton the Poisson bracket on the space obtained by Hamiltonian reduction, you just need to gain this formula, nothing else. And this leaves us with the complete dictionary that I want to use today, okay, in which we've added these extra three lines at the bottom that a non commutative moment map will be such that the matrix representing it will be a usual moment map, okay. So recall that we have a GLN action, so this thing will be valued in little GLN star that you identify with little GLN, OK? So just the n times n matrix. And then this algebra where you quotient your non-commutative moment map by being equal to some constant lambda, it's the same as geometrically looking at the pre-image under the moment map of a multiple of the identity, multiple being exactly this lambda that we took. And then finally, the Lie algebra that we obtain on the vector space obtained from A lambda just govern the Poisson bracket on the Hamiltonian reduction. So this is a nice dictionary. So now the question is, how can you relate that to integrable systems? OK, so uh, let me just say that for the rest of this talk, I will assume that uh, this uh, orbit space rep a n mod GLNC or the corresponding Hamiltonian reduction, if you have a moment map, is a smooth uh, variety so that you can just consider it as a complex manifold, okay? And then here, what I will just do is discuss, okay, how can you in this complex manifold find big families of uh, Poisson commuting functions, okay? Because the, the problem is that the functional independence, I think, as you may all guess, it's something purely geometric, so I don't think it's possible to understand it just on a commutative algebra, but, but I may be wrong, okay? so. Let's look at again at this formula that we have on the top, which is telling you that on the reduced space or on the Hamiltonian reduction, the Poisson bracket between the trace of a matrix representing an element A and the trace of a matrix representing B is given to be what? It's the trace of the matrix representing this thing, which remember is just first you compute the double bracket of A and B, and then you just multiply the two uh, factors in your tensor product. And so you have this uh, very silly lemma that if this this thing appearing there is a commutator, well, obviously the matrix representing it will be a matrix commutator, a commutator of matrices, so its trace is zero. So the functions trace of curly x of a and trace of curly x of b will be Poisson commuting. Okay, and so now the point is just to use that lemma as much as you wish. Okay, and so a first way to use that lemma, which is a well, really important in applications is that if you can find an element in your algebra such that the double bracket of this element A with itself is a sum of terms of the form A to some power tensor something minus that something tensor A to the same power, if the double bracket has this form, then the, mat uh, the matrix representing A is what we would call a lax matrix, meaning that the trace of any power of the matrix representing A, these things are Poisson commuting. And this is really just a two-line proof, okay? So again, 
if you are getting a bit confused now, take a screenshot and when you have five minutes, try to derive that from the axioms of a double bracket. This is really fun and easy. Okay, so what is the weakest form of this lax lemma that you can use? Well, if you have a double bracket which is zero, then obviously this happens, okay? And in particular, this is the case in that algebra that I wrote earlier. Okay, so this is the free algebra on two generators. Okay, the double bracket of each generator, uh, each generator with itself is zero, but the generator, uh, uh, the double bracket between themselves is this uh, one tensor one. Okay. Here, Maxime, oh, uh, it's yeah. a five-minute warning. Okay, perfect. Uh, so here you have a moment map. You can really compute it. It's uh, quite easy to see. But what is important for later is that the double bracket of this element y with itself is zero, meaning that the trace of the matrix representing y to any power k will be Poisson commuting between themselves. Okay. So in particular, if this, cur uh, this matrix is representing x and y, I wrote them capital X and capital Y, you get Poisson commuting elements here. Okay. The only thing is that if lambda is non zero, you get here an empty space. If it, and if lambda is zero, you get the commuting variety, which is not nice, not smooth. So you need to add a, a something to get a, an interesting ex, uh, integrable system from this example. Okay, so how to add something? The idea is to understand that the particular example that I gave can be constructed with quivers. Okay, and Vandenberg constructed a double Poisson bracket and a moment map for any quiver. Okay, so what is a quiver? It's just a directed graph. Okay, so for example, you, here you have a one loop quiver. What you can do from this quiver Q0 is double it. Okay, so you add an arrow in the opposite direction for each arrow in the initial quiver. Okay, and then you consider the corresponding pass algebra of this double, meaning that it's the algebra of all the paths that you can do here. And you obviously see that here you can either go through X or Y. So it's really just a free algebra on two generators. And so, in fact, this example that I gave is a particular example of the construction of Vandenberg. And so what is the best way to kind of salvage the commuting function that we had? It's just to add a new vertex here, and we get this quiver Q1, okay. And quite nicely, when now you apply all this theory to uh, the pass algebra of the double of this Q1, look at representation spaces and so on and so forth. I will explain that in the second part of the talk a bit more. You get an interesting space, the Kerr mother space and the commuting function that we had are just defining the Kerr mother integrable system. So it's an important integrable system that you get quite easily here. So what else can you do? Well, instead of just taking a one loop quiver, you can begin with a cyclic quiver, okay? So these are all these arrows X uh, at the on the outside of this uh, circle, okay? Then what you can do is just add new arrows from a new vertex to all the elements in that cyclic quiver, okay? So I denote them uh, Vs alpha. And then you double this quiver and by Vandenberg theory, you get a double person bracket and a moment map on the corresponding pass algebra. So why is that interesting? Well, because if now you go anticlockwise along this cyclic quiver with all these uh, doubles of the initial elements X, you get this Y bullet and the double bracket of this element Y bullet with itself is zero. So you will know that on any representation space, if it's non empty, obviously, you will get that the trace of the matrix representing this Y bullet to any power K, such traces are Poisson commuting. Okay, so this gives you a good candidate to find an integrable system. And basically this has work, been worked out by Shalik and Silantiev in several, lots of examples, but not any cyclic quiver like this. Okay, they had some restrictions on the framing arrows. But what is more or less important to understand here is that you can visualize all these Poisson commuting elements in some way at the algebra level. So for example, these elements of interest, this Y bullet to the K, this just denote going anticlockwise along the cyclic river K times. Okay, what are the other elements commuting with that? Well, you come from infinity, you go to S, to some vertex S with some element Vs alpha, a framing arrow that we added. You go K times through the loop, and then we come back to infinity using the opposite arrow of this V. You get like that uh, an integrable system, and in fact, what you can do is uh, extend that to get, in fact, maximal integrability of 
the mate, uh, any trace of Y bullet to the K. This is some joint work in progress with uh, Tamash Gerber. Okay, so this is uh, the general idea of this non-commutative Poisson geometry and its application to integrable systems. And in the parallel talk, I will explain a bit uh, some details on this rational Kerr-Germoser system, how to get the elliptic Kerr-Germoser system with such an interpretation, then explain how to get double quasi Poisson bracket and the relation to integrable systems. And finally, if you are interested to know where double brackets are, are happening to be in uh, mass, well, <laughs> I've collected uh, lots of application on the on my website. So just have a look if you think that something may be fun to look at. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Maxime. So let's let's give Maxime a round of applause, uh, especially using emojis. Let's all use our emojis. Thank you. Um, thank you for the wonderful talk. So, uh, without further ado, let's uh, let's move to our next speaker. Um, Peter, where are you, Peter? Peter Crooks, yeah. Uh, hi, Peter. So I'm going to make you a co-host so that you will be able right. to uh, share your slides. Okay. How's that? Excellent. Yeah, we right. can. So we can. We can see a lot of the window surrounding your slides. Your slides. Ah, okay. How about this? Yes. Perfect. Now we. Now we just see the slides. Yeah. Perfect. Very good. Very good. Okay. So, um, uh, we're just going to wait a couple of minutes uh, sure. in case uh, some people want to tune in specifically for your talk. Um, and in the meantime, um, I want to say. Um, a little bit more about the format. Um, the, uh, uh, the uh, following this uh, plenary presentation session, we have one hour of uh, what is called parallel presentation session. So all the four speakers from this two hour session will be split into uh, four separate Zoom rooms um, where they will give a second part of their talk and a discussion. And the second part of their talk is supposed to be much more uh, informal compared to the plenary talk. So feel free to interrupt, ask questions, and also feel free to circulate between um, uh, between the different rooms. So all that, all the uh, all the links to the correct rooms, you can find them in the conference package. And uh, maybe another thing I will mention uh, is that uh, after the parallel session. Uh, there's going to be a 15 minute screen free break where we encourage everyone to step off their screens for about 15 minutes and stretch, stretch your legs. Um, but then we encourage everyone to come back and uh, participate in a, a, a networking session. So this is the first networking session that we're going to hold. Uh, I'll explain the format when we get to it. Uh, but basically, uh, the, the catchphrase is that uh, it's, it's going to be kind of like an academic speed dating. Um, so it should be it should be very uh, entertaining, hopefully. Um, so d please don't miss it. <laughs> okay, so maybe uh, it's time, right? Uh, more or less, yeah, I think so. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, so I'm glad to introduce Peter Crooks, uh, the second speaker of this session uh, from Northeastern University, who will talk about partial compactifications of principal Poisson slices. Hey, uh, thank you first and foremost to the organizers for convening uh, this meeting. It, um, I, I, I say as someone that uh, has organized an online conference before, um, this, is, this is about the most meticulously planned and, and uh, executed thing of that sort that I've seen. Um, so I, I, I really want to commend the organizers for that. Um, it's very much appreciated. Uh, so today I would like to talk about a subject that is at the interface of uh, Lie theory and Poisson geometry. Um, and so I thought I'd uh, start by talking about the former um, in order to set the stage for coherently speaking about the latter. So I'll start with the Lie theoretic foundations and esoterics that we will actually need. Okay. All right. So once and for all, uh, I'm going to, oops, I'm going to denote by capital G, a uh, complex semi-simple linear algebraic group 
of rank equal to L. R should be used for something else. Um, and I, I want this group to be of, of adjoint type. So a paradigm example to keep in mind would be the projective special linear group, PSLN, uh, over the complex numbers, rather than the, the simply connected group, SLN. Okay, this will be needed for a construction a little bit later. Okay, and I'm going to let little g be the Lie algebra of my group. And of course, this is a finite dimensional complex semi-simple Lie algebra. Um, and so the killing form on that Lie algebra is non-degenerate, and it thereby gives rise to an identification of the Lie algebra with its dual, by which I will make um, no further distinction between these two vector spaces. Um, and at the same time, we can look at the dual of the Lie algebra with its canonical Lie Poisson structure and transfer it over to the Lie algebra by using the isomorphism. So this is going to render the Lie algebra G a Poisson variety, just like that. Now, of course, there are many things that one can say about this uh, Poisson structure on, on, uh, on the Lie algebra. Um, I, I'd like to say something um, that is, is perhaps not, um, not emphasized a great deal, but that is going to feature very prominently uh, in this talk. And it begins with the following considerations. So first, I'm going to fix inside of my Lie algebra an SL2 triple, E, H, and F of elements. So by this, I mean that E, H, and F are uh, elements of the Lie algebra G, and they satisfy the Lie bracket identities that one would imagine if uh, E, H, and F were the standard three generators of SL2. Okay, so just, a, just a very uh, standard concept. Um, and now uh, any uh, SL2 triple tau will um, determine an associated Slotovy slice. So one defines it by taking the third element, F, of the triple, computing its Lie algebra centralizer. So now this is some vector subspace of the Lie algebra. Um, and then one translates that subspace by the first element, E, of the triple. So the result is now just an affine linear subspace of the Lie algebra. And this is the Slotovy slice associated to the SL2 triple tau. And this turns out to interact very nicely with the Poisson structure on the Lie algebra uh, that I have just mentioned in the following sense. It turns out, this Slotovy slice, it turns out to be a Poisson transversal inside of the Lie algebra G with respect to the Poisson structure that I have just, that I've just defined on G. So just recall a Poisson transversal in a, in a smooth Poisson variety is a locally closed subvariety with the property of being transverse to all of the symplectic leaves and such that its intersection with every symplectic leaf is a symplectic subvariety of that leaf. This and a great deal more is true of the Slotovy slice S tau. Um, but from my standpoint, we're working in a little bit too much generality. I don't want to work with completely arbitrary Slotovy slices all of the time. I want to specialize the, uh, to those that come from some very special SL2 triples tau. Um, and so to that end, I'm going to call, well, I'm not calling it this, but it is called an SL2 triple tau is called a principal SL2 triple if the dimension of its Slotovy slice coincides with the rank of the group. And, and um, these have been investigated in, in many different ways over the years. They have um, principal SL2 triples have a number of, of very, very nice properties. And one is as follows. If you have any two principal SL2 triples, you can look at their associated Slotovy slices. And those slices are going to be related by the adjoint action of the group G. So more precisely, uh, and this was proved by, proved by Costant, if you have two principal SL2 triples, then there is some element of the group that translates the Slotovy slice associated to one triple into the Slotovy slice associated to the other. 
Um, and this, this Lee theoretic fact uh, is going to feature quite prominently in uh, the treatment of Poisson slices that I'm about to give. Um, and, and so that's where I'm going to go next. I'm going to talk about Poisson slices in general. So one begins by fixing two pieces of information. The first is a Hamiltonian G variety X. And, and for me, this means that X is a smooth Poisson variety endowed with a Hamiltonian action of the group G um, and a moment map that I have denoted by nu. Okay, so that is the first piece of information that I must fix if I'm going to talk about Poisson slices. The second piece of information is simply an SL2 triple tau. Okay, and then I make the following observation. I can look at the pre-image of the Slotovy slice for tau under this moment map. And well, as I said, this slice is a Poisson transversal and the moment map nu is a Poisson morphism. So it will thereby under the pre-image operation take Poisson transversals to Poisson transversals. And so as a consequence, the pre-image of this Slotovy slice under nu is going to be a Poisson transversal in my, in my Poisson variety X. And so this, this pre-image, which I'll denote by X tau, thereby acquires a Poisson structure. So I've, I've just produced a new Poisson variety. And I'm gonna give a name to that Poisson variety. Uh, I'm gonna call that Poisson variety X tau, the Poisson slice of X uh, determined by the SL2 triple tau, okay? Now that's just a, just a convenient definition. Okay, and, but again, I, I, I want to emphasize the case of a principal SL2 triple tau. So let's see what happens if tau is one of those. Well, let's suppose I have two principal SL2 triples. I can look at the Slotovy slice for each. Those are going to be related by the adjoint action of the group. And because the moment map is equivariant, the pre-images of those slices are going to be related by the action of the group on X. So in other words, those pre-images are going to be Poisson isomorphic to each other. And so more precisely, one has this as a corollary of Costin's theorem, that if tau one and tau two are two principal SL2 triples, then the Poisson slices that they determine are going to be isomorphic as Poisson varieties. Not in a canonical way, but they will at least be isomorphic to each other. And so it is in that spirit that I will write the following. I'm gonna denote by X prin the uh, Poisson slice associated to tau, where tau is any principal SL2 triple. And this is well-defined up to, up to Poisson isomorphism by the, by the corollary that I just mentioned. Um, and so I'm going to call this X prin the principal uh, Poisson slice of X, okay? All right, uh, so in what follows, I'd like to give uh, a couple of, of very, very concrete examples of, of principal Poisson slices. Um, and and just for just for pure convenience, um, I'm I'm not going to work with Hamiltonian G varieties um, at the moment. I'm going to work with Hamiltonian G times G varieties. So of course the moment maps are going to take values now in the Lie algebra direct sum itself, and SL2 triples will now be in the Lie algebra direct sum itself. But the theory of Poisson slices and principal Poisson slices is, is completely analogous. So I hope you'll forgive me for that. Okay, so for my first example, I can look at the cotangent bundle of the group G. And one knows that this cotangent bundle comes equipped with a canonical Hamiltonian action of the group times itself. Okay, and so I've, I've represented this by uh, this bullet point right here. And so now one can ask for this Hamiltonian G times G variety, what is the principal Poisson slice? And well, I'm not going to be able to do justice to this, um, except to say that the uh, principal Poisson slice 
in the cotangent bundle for this G times G action um, is, a, is a variety known as the universal centralizer of my, uh, of my Lie algebra. So this is a, this is a Coulomb branch um, that shows up in the work of uh, Braverman, Finkelberg, and uh, Nakajima. Um, and it's received quite a lot of attention in representation theoretic contexts. And I, I, I will say a little bit more about that uh, a bit later. Um, but for now, I just want to make a very, very simple observation that because this principal Poisson slice is a Poisson transversal in T star of G, which is symplectic, this um, principal Poisson slice, this universal centralizer, is automatically going to be a symplectic subvariety of the cotangent bundle. So not only is it some, some Poisson variety, but in this case, it happens to be a symplectic variety. OK, now I want to do something um, a little bit more nuanced and perhaps interesting, whereby I take the cotangent bundle um, and I replace it with a Poisson variety that, that is just a little bit larger, OK? Um, and, and the way I'm going to do that uh, is as follows. So first, because my group G is of adjoint type, I can look at its Deconcini Procesi wonderful compactification. So this is a smooth projective variety, um, and it contains a copy of the group G as an open dense subvariety. Um, and now the complement of G in its wonderful compactification uh, is, a, is a normal crossing divisor. So I have a smooth projective variety, capital G, uh, G bar, um, and I have a normal crossing divisor in it. Um, and so I can associate to these two pieces of information, a log cotangent bundle, which is typically denoted like that. And this is going to be a log symplectic variety, so nearly symplectic, but not quite. Uh, it's going to be a log symplectic variety um, that contains the cotangent bundle of the group G uh, as its unique open dense symplectic leaf. So it's just a very, very slight enlargement of the cotangent bundle of the group G, okay? Um, and the good news is that the Hamiltonian action of G times G on the cotangent bundle uh, extends to such an action on the log cotangent bundle. Um, and so I can look at Poisson slices now in the log cotangent bundle with respect to this Hamiltonian action of the group times itself. What happens in that case? Well, because the cotangent bundle is only slightly enlarged into the log cotangent bundle, I would expect to get something just slightly larger than the universal centralizer when I take the principal Poisson slice here. Um, and that's exactly what happens. And, and, and to denote or to indicate that this is just a, just a small enlargement of the universal centralizer, um, I'll, I'll denote this by uh, ZG bar, just like that. Um, and now, whereas the universal centralizer uh, is a symplectic subvariety of the cotangent bundle, the analogous statement here uh, is that this object, the ZG bar, is a log symplectic subvariety of the log cotangent bundle, just like that. Okay. All right. So the relationship between the universal centralizer um, and its slight enlargement um, has been has been treated in the literature before, um, and is due to Anna Balibanu. Um, and and so for the next few minutes, I would like to. Um, uh, give a version uh, of, of one of, of Balibanu's results that happens to suit my uh, particular purposes in this talk. Okay. So uh, Anna showed that there is a commutative diagram um, of this form. So I have the universal centralizer. I have a map to ZG bar. This map is, is just the inclusion map. Um, and I have maps to the cotangent bundle uh, quotiented by the action of G times G, not Hamiltonian reduction, just quotient. Um, and in this context, she shows that the, the map J um, is an open Poisson embedding. In fact, she actually shows 
that the universal centralizer is the unique open dent symplectic leaf um, in this slightly larger log symplectic variety. But she actually does a great deal more than that. And what's really interesting is that while the fibers of this first projection pi are, are only affine varieties, uh, she shows that the fibers of, of the second projection, this pi bar from the larger space, are actually projective varieties, just like that. Um, and, and so one can um, sort of conceptualize of this as follows. One can take the universal centralizer, Zg, um, and well, while one is not compactifying it, one is compactifying it as a variety over the cotangent bundle, just naive quotient by uh, the group times itself. Um, and somehow this, this fiber-wise or partial compactification process also respects the Poisson, in this case, symplectic structure of the universal centralizer. Now, uh, how can one look at this um, in, a, in a more holistic way? Well, one can say, let's set X equal to the cotangent bundle of, of the group G. Okay, well, then the universal centralizer, as I said before, is X prin. And what this is saying is that one may compactify X prin over X mod whatever group is acting on X. So one hopes to make that statement then um, in some greater generality. Okay, compactifying X prin as a variety over X mod whatever group is acting on X. So that's what I that's what I want to pursue uh, for the moment, um, and um, I'm just going to switch back to Hamiltonian uh, G varieties. I use G times G here because this was useful for the purposes of examples, but um, I'm going to go back to Hamiltonian G varieties. Um, and then, so the task is as follows. If you have any Hamiltonian G variety X, what do you want to do to this? Well, you want to construct a diagram um, of this form where X is the principal Poisson slice um, and you want a bunch of extra maps um, and you want another variety X print bar, just like that. Okay. So of course, uh, mimicking what happened in the case of the universal centralizer, what requirements would one hope for in a diagram like this? Well, first, this X print bar had better be a Poisson variety, maybe not log symplectic like in the case of ZG bar, um, but it had better at least be Poisson if the original Poisson variety X um, was only Poisson. That seems reasonable. Um, and then secondly, well, one would hope for uh, this map J, whatever we construct it to be if we're successful, one would hope for this to be an open uh, embedding of Poisson varieties. A third thing one would hope for uh, is that uh, the fibers of this, this map pi bar, which we would hope to construct, uh, are actually projective varieties, just like in the case of um, uh, ZG bar. Um, and then finally, um, again, referring back to the case of ZG, uh, that was a principal Poisson slice that happened to be symplectic. Um, and then the bar space for that happened to be log symplectic. And so one might also hope that if X print happens to be a symplectic variety, then this general construction would produce an X print bar uh, that is a log symplectic variety. So these are all things that one might ask for in a general construction. Um, and sort of skimming over the various technicalities involved, uh, Marcus uh, Roser and I showed uh, that this can be achieved in the presence of, of certain assumptions about X. So that's kind of a contentless statement because I'm not telling you what those certain assumptions are. And so um, it's not too hard to satisfy a, uh, a theorem like this, but um, uh, there are some very concrete conditions that do give rise to a large family of examples. And uh, if I have time, maybe I'll, I'll talk about that in the uh, in the subsequent session. Uh, okay. Peter, a, a, a five minute warning. Yep. Perfect. 
Okay, um, and uh, because time remains, I'll, I'll maybe give you just a, a very, very rough indication um, of how this, how this construction actually works, what, uh, how, you, how you complete it. So the very rough idea is as follows. You let tau be any SL2 triple, okay? And well, uh, what you can do is you can take the product of the group G with the Slotovy slice associated to tau. So that's a perfectly nice affine variety. Um, but this affine variety turns out to be a Hamiltonian G variety um, in, a, in a very nice um, explicit way. And it also happens to be symplectic. So I'm not going to explain how that's the case, but um, it does have the virtue of being true. Okay, now, um, what else can one say? Well, you can take a general Hamiltonian G variety X and you can take its product with this Hamiltonian G variety. And then you can reduce that at level zero. You can take the Hamiltonian reduction of an arbitrary X times G times S tau. And what do you get? Well, it turns out you get a Poisson variety that is canonically isomorphic to the Poisson slice of X associated to tau. And now, well, we were looking to at least enlarge this space a little bit when tau uh, is a, it was a principal SL2 triple. So why not try to enlarge this space a little bit uh, for a general SL2 triple tau? And one way to do this is by taking G times S tau and possibly replacing it with a Hamiltonian G variety that is just a little bit larger. And then through this isomorphism, we'll be getting some very, very slight enlargement of X tau. Okay, that's the, that's the idea. Um, and so one can do exactly this. One can enlarge G times S tau uh, to a uh, log symplectic Hamiltonian G variety, G times S tau bar. And then as I said, one simply inserts G times S tau bar in place of G times S tau and obtains a a slightly larger space that I will denote by X tau bar, this Hamiltonian reduction. Um, now, of course, uh, this doesn't always make sense. This quotient might not always exist. So this is one of the technicalities that someone has to worry about when doing this construction, um, but it often does exist, okay? And then, um, well, because the original objective was to construct an X prim bar with various nice properties, um, one then specializes this construction to the case of a principal SL2 triple tau, okay? So this is very, very roughly how everything works. And, um, and I think I will stop there. Thank you. Thank you very much, Peter. Let's, let's give Peter a round of applause, uh, especially emoji applause. Everyone click your emoji applause. Thank you very much, Peter. Sure. Wonderful talk. Okay, so without uh, further ado, then uh, let's uh, move on to our third speaker, Eva. So Eva, I'm going to make you a co-host so you'll be able to share your slides. And uh, I'm going to ask you to unmute yourself as well. Hi, okay. So should I go ahead and share them? Yeah, you should share it. We will wait uh, for just a few minutes in case someone wants to, someone wanted to tune in specifically mm -hmm. for your talk. Uh, we shouldn't start uh, too long in advance. Um, can you see them okay? Yeah, yes, you can see them yes. perfectly. Okay, okay great. Yeah. I recommend, oops, sorry. <laughs> I recommend using uh, these few minutes to stretch. Uh, we're all sitting in front of our computers for too long. Too long. Um, in the earlier session today, someone recommended that we use these uh, breaks for like a two minute yoga, which I think is a brilliant <laughs> idea. Someone should lead a two minute yoga session. Yeah. So I, I also want to uh, maybe make a remark uh, to use up the, the break time. Um, uh, so uh, 
after the parallel session, we'll have uh, the networking session. And then after the networking session, uh, we will have social time, um, which uh, I encourage everyone to attend. It's a great way to, you know, uh, meet fellow members of the Poisson community in a, in a much more informal setting and have a laugh. Uh, we have three activities scheduled. Uh, one of them is Pictionary. Uh, we also have uh, code names and Mafia. Uh, Mafia is uh, kind of hard, hard level because it involves a lot of uh, reading of the rules. Um, uh, code names, on the other hand, is, is very, very easy. Um, anyone can learn how to play code names in, in a snap. So I really encourage everyone to, to come and enjoy um, some time. How are you, Eva? Good. Are you in uh, Are you in Boston? Yes, that's right. <laughs> yeah. Have you You've started teaching, haven't you? Yeah. How is uh, that going? It's going well. We're using the hybrid approach, mm -hmm. uh, which involves a lot of technology, uh, having people both in the classroom and online. Uh -huh. At the same time or not? Yeah, at the same time. But so far, it's going fairly smoothly. I'm pleasantly surprised. <laughs> Okay. It, it's, it's the second time I hear about this approach, like having people both online and offline for the same uh, for the same mm -hmm. lecture or seminar. And it happened like the second time I hear it in like two hours. Oh, really? I, tr I tried. So, yeah, the first time she heard it, I think it's from me. Uh, I had my first go at this hybrid approach today, which I found absolutely horrific. <laughs> yeah. uh, I mean, I just don't know. I mean, you may, you know, everyone may have their own uh, opinion about online versus in person, which one is better for which kind of class. But I think hybrid is like the worst of both worlds. <laughs> That's my opinion. <laughs> that is my personal opinion. I think if uh, if you're going to do something, I mean, you might as well just go fully, fully online. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Anyway. I think it makes a difference for the, so I was feeling the same as you for a while, but I think it makes a difference for the students that, that they get to be on campus and see their friends. Right, and but aren't I, they not supposed to do that? Uh, I mean, if it was fully <laughs> online somehow, maybe people wouldn't be moving into uh, sort of the, camp, the campus geographically. Yeah, but is that necessarily a problem? I mean, yeah, I guess, I guess in, in this case, uh, probably that might be a smart thing to do to social distance more. But. Yes. Yeah. I mean, so uh, in Geneva, it's kind of somewhat left up to each individual professor in some way. I mean, there are some kind of rules that they have to abide by, whatever. But uh, the, the course that I am uh, assisting with in particular, I, the, the decision was made that uh, students with an even number student ID come to oh. uh, the classroom <laughs> and with odd, they, they tune in through Zoom and then it alternates every week, which is, I mean, it's just, I don't know, it just doesn't make any sense to me wow. at all. Either I'm thick and there's some kind of deeper, wonderful meaning to this, but I just, I'm not seeing it at all. <laughs> Sounds interesting. <laughs> I'm, pre I'm, pre I'm passionate about it because <laughs> uh, I'm full of emotion. I experienced it for the first time today, and I feel like if I were a student, I would be furious because this uh -huh. just makes no, this makes zero sense to uh -huh. me. So, yeah, I'm angry. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> well, I I know how you feel. But I guess I'm just accepted the situation. Try to make the best of it. <laughs> right. No, I think your approach is much healthier. That's for sure. I'm going more zen. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, I'm missing some of that. Okay, I think I think okay, we should, we're probably ready. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah. So our third speaker for this section uh, is Eva Halacheva, also from Northeastern University, who will talk about Schubert calculus via Lagrangian correspondences. Uh, thank you for the introduction. It's great to be here, and I would like to thank the organizers for inviting me. Um, so I should mention that this is joint work with Alan Knudsen and Paul Zinjustin. You'll see their names pop up 
in some of my slides as well, um, a little bit later on. Um, and um, I have to say I'm a little bit sad because um, this is a Poisson workshop and I have some symplectic and Lagrangian structures in my talk, but as far as I can tell, nothing here is Poisson um, per se. So if you see, if you find something Poisson, please let me know. <laughs> that is sort of a, a more of an epitome of the Poisson structure. So, um, okay, let me start with a little bit of the um, overview of what we're, uh, I'm going to talk about. So I'll start with some background and motivation for Schubert calculus and um, what, are, what are the classical questions there. And then um, I'm going to talk about a, a branching, which is um, uh, in cohomology, but more uh, of a combinatorial nature. And then I will explain um, how, uh, with my collaborators, we would like to interpret it and upgrade it um, to a more um, geometric picture. And uh, I'll mention at the end some results um, towards this goal so far. So um, here's the setup. Uh, so we're starting with partial flag varieties. So we have a complex algebraic group G and let's fix a pinning for it. So namely a, a torus inside a Borel inside G and then W will denote the Val group. Um, uh, for our uh, group G and uh, so for any parabolic P, uh, we have uh, the quotient G mod P, which is a smooth projective variety. And the torus acts on that and the torus fixed points can be um, identified with the quotient of the Val group uh, by the uh, parabolic Val group, either as a left or right quotient. And so what I'm interested in generally is studying the equivariant cohomology of uh, such a partial flag variety. So um, the torus equivariant cohomology and um, operations such as multiplication and restriction. So of course, those are understood well abstractly, but um, I would like to consider them in a nice basis, which I'll talk about in a moment. So for instance, uh, here, the first operation is uh, multiplication in, uh, in the cohomology. And the second operation is restricting uh, from one partial flag variety to another, um, where H here is a subgroup of G with a compatible parabolic Q and torus S. And so this is the completely general setup, but um, I would like to focus uh, more concretely on the case where G is of classical type. So it's of type A and B and C and or DN, and we have a maximal parabolic. And in that case, um, uh, the partial flag variety um, is usually called the Grassmannian of that particular type. So for instance, we can consider um, the Grassmannian of K planes in N space. Um, so uh, this final line here is uh, giving this description, which is the quotient of the general linear group by the parabolic, which has blocks of size K and N minus K. And uh, similarly, we can consider the symplectic Grassmannian, which is an analogous quotient of the symplectic group um, by such a parabolic. And um, this can be realized as isotropic k-planes in some even dimensional complex space. OK, so um, now that I've um, set the stage, let me talk about this nice basis that um, I mentioned um, we want to consider for the cohomology of a partial flag variety. So um, this is the basis of Schubert classes. So uh, let's take uh, any of the torus fixed points of our partial flag variety. So going back to the general setting, um, then a Schubert class indexed by that point is given by the B minus orbit of uh, the P inverse point in the partial flag variety. B minus here just denotes the opposite Borel or the Borel um, B. So we take the closure of this orbit and the class um, for this variety is um, called the Schubert class indexed by pi. And um, so as I promised you, these Schubert classes really generate um, the equivariant um, cohomology of the partial flag variety as a module over the equivariant cohomology of a point. 
And so uh, what we're, uh, one of the classical questions for these um, Schubert classes is to study um, their product and the structure constants for their multiplication and um, understand their symmetry or certain positivity properties. Um, and even more classically in the representation theory, if you um, consider in particular the Grossmannian of K planes, um, and here we look at regular cohomology, so non-equivariant, um, then these structure constants are the little Wood Richardson coefficients. So they're giving us um, precisely how highest weight tensor products of highest weight irreducible representations um, decompose um, in, uh, again into um, irreducibles. And uh, so here's a, a even more specific example for the Grossmannian of two planes in four space. Um, uh, for the torus, uh, in this case, um, we have that the equivariant cohomology is a um, polynomial ring in four variables. And so um, the Schubert classes um, I mentioned are indexed by elements of the Val group quotient. And in this case, we can realize them as partitions. And so suppose we're multiplying the Schubert class indexed by a box with another Schubert class indexed by a box. You can decompose it in this way, where the last term only appears in the equivariant setting. Um, uh, if you work non-equivariantly, you only see uh, the first two terms. OK, so um, uh, let me mention now a result for understanding these uh, coefficients. So um, there's a theorem by Knudsen and Tao from 2003, which has had um, multiple extensions um, since. Um, so um, again, we're working in the Grossmannian uh, setting. And in that case, the Schubert classes can actually be indexed by binary sequences. So um, uh, a binary sequence that contains k zeros and n minus k ones is what this notation means. And so uh, to understand the structure constants here, we're looking at a certain Boltzmann weight um, constructed using these combinatorial puzzles that I've drawn at, at the bottom, um, some examples of. So suppose we want to find the mu coefficient of lambda times mu. So then you put lambda mu and mu on the boundary of such a triangle. And there are certain rules for how you can fill in this triangle. And um, then uh, once you filled it, uh, using R matrices from the five vertex model in statistical mechanics, this gives you a coefficient for uh, mu. So um, in this example here, it's actually the same product we saw in the previous slide, but now uh, I'm using the um, alternative and equivalent indexing uh, with binary sequences. And you can see that the first puzzle corresponds to the first class, the second puzzle corresponds to the second class, and the third puzzle, which has this blue or equivariant piece, gives us the coefficient here. And all the coefficients should be living in equivariant cohomology of a point. There might be more than one puzzle uh, adding up to each of the coefficients, but um, in this example, we only have one for each. OK. so. Uh, this is sort of the classical problem addressed uh, using puzzles um, of multiplying Schubert classes. So uh, what I'm interested in is studying the inclusion of the symplectic Grossmannian into the usual um, or type A Grossmannian. And this inclusion is realized uh, through the uh, um, thinking of the symplectic group as the six points of the general linear group under a certain involution. Uh, which I just uh, write down here. It's not, uh, the details are not too important, but um, this is what happens to a matrix. Um, and the fixed points under this involution are the symplectic group. And this gives us the inclusion um, of these Grossmannians. So if you think about the pullback of this inclusion in um, equivariant cohomology, we're interested in what happens to a Schubert class when you expand it again into Schubert classes. And uh, what are, how are these coefficients determined? And so um, there's some previous work by Pragach and Joshkun, uh, where they work with um, Lagra either with the Lagrangian Grossmannian 
or with the more general Grassmannian but non equivariant group. Um, so, um, the way uh, we address this problem is um, so, first of all, we're interested in the map on the right side. So, this is the pullback of the inclusion. But uh, since both of these Grassmannians are smooth projective spaces, we have Cor1 injectivity. And so, uh, we know that their cohomologies inject into the equivariant cohomologies of their torus fixed points. And um, so uh, instead we can work on the uh, left side instead. So we can work with just torus fixed points. And there's a formula by Anderson, Janssen, and Zergel, um, um, as well as Billy independently um, that describes how you can restrict to torus fixed points the Schubert classes. So this is uh, our approach to the, uh, showing the following theorem. So uh, this pullback map uh, from the Grossmannian to the symplectic Grossmannian um, in their cohomologies um, can be described again using puzzles. And um, these are um, W of such a puzzle is um, again, a certain type of Boltzmann weight where uh, we've um, incorporated the R and K matrices now of the five vertex model. And remember, we realized the inclusion um, using a certain involution on the general linear group. And this, in fact, can be seen as an involution on the puzzles coming from this Grassmann duality of the isomorphism between the two Grassmannian varieties. And um, so we get a certain involution on puzzles, and we only consider the puzzles fixed under this involution. And uh, they allow us to compute the coefficients here. Um, so I'm giving this more as a motivation. I won't include um, the general details in this setting, but um, let me just give you an example of how um, this works. So here is a Schubert class for the Grossmannian, and we pull it back. And remember, we start with binary sequences. Um, uh, once we are in the symplectic Grassmannian, the indices generalize to ternary sequences. So um, things are indexed by 1, 0, and 10. And um, here's an example of such an expansion, which corresponds to these puzzles. Now, the goal is to generalize um, uh, this uh, somewhat more combinatorial and homological or cohomological um, um, puzzle rule to uh, the six vertex model in statistical mechanics, as well as to understand uh, the underlying geometry um, to obtain a more generalized uh, puzzle rule, perhaps. So let me move on to the more geometric um, side of this story. So to do that, um, let me uh, introduce Lagrangian correspondences. So a Lagrangian correspondence uh, between two um, symplectic manifolds A and B is just a Lagrangian cycle in minus A times B, where by minus A, I mean uh, we are negating the symplectic form on A. Um, so this is just a linear combination of some varieties in uh, minus A class B. And if we furthermore have a torus action um, as before, under which this um, Lagrangian cycle is invariant, then um, such a Lagrangian correspondence induces a map in um, localized equivariant cohomology from A to B. So um, localized just meaning we're uh, tensoring with the field of fractions um, of the equivariant cohomology over a point. But uh, so the key property to remember is a Lagrangian correspondence gives us a map in cohomology. And our symplectic manifolds, uh, for our purposes, are going to be the, the cotangent bundles of the partial flag varieties um, in this picture. OK, so some examples of uh, such uh, Lagrangian correspondences are symplectic reduction. So if you have a Hamiltonian action, um, then we can consider the moment map and um, the preimage um, of a regular value under the moment map um, gives us um, another uh, manifold Z. 
which is a Lagrangian cycle in the product of uh, our original symplectic manifold X and the GIT quotient uh, obtained from the um, regular value, which is also a um, G fixed point. So symplectic reduction is a, an example of a Lagrangian correspondence. Um, another type of Lagrangian correspondence is given uh, by the Mollico-Kunkov stable envelopes. So suppose we have a symplectic resolution with a circle action. So S here is a circle um, acting on X and uh, we take a fixed point component um, for this circle, uh, let's call it C. Uh, then um, Mollico and Kunkov give us um, via so-called stable envelope construction, another Lagrangian cycle which is the closure of the attracting set of C um, under the circle action, together with um, some additional uh, components which are themselves attracting sets. And um, the additional components that we add um, uh, cause L to behave nicely under composition. So when we try to compose Lagrangian cycles, for instance. So let me talk about a few other um, correspondences. So more generally, uh, we can think of a correspondence which is not Lagrangian, but let's think about correspondences coming from graphs of morphisms. So if we have um, a morphism between two oriented manifolds, now not necessarily symplectic, um, then we can consider the graph of this morphism and um, so that graph gives us a correspondence um, um, between the two manifolds, which induces um, the pullback map of our original morphism in cohomology. So uh, some examples of this are if you consider the diagonal inclusion, then the graph or the transpose of the graph of this map uh, induces multiplication in cohomology. Or if you, can cons if you consider the um, graph of the following inclusion, so this is, an, uh, so here by flag of JKN, I mean, another instance of a partial flag variety, um, which can be realized as J planes inside K planes inside N space. So this includes by, uh, into the uh, product of the Grossmannians by forgetting the K plane or the J plane. Um, so this inclusion induces uh, another multiplication on the level of these Grossmannians and flag varieties. And finally, um, for our example of interest, the inclusion map of the symplectic Grossmannian into the Grossmannian, its graph induces the restriction map in cohomology. Alternatively, we can work in um, equivariant cohomology here. Okay, so. Um, let me, so keeping in mind these uh, correspondences coming from graphs, uh, let me um, talk a little bit how we're going to lift our original uh, function to um, these, um, to, uh, to these, using these types of correspondences. So um, suppose, again, we have two manifolds A and B, and we started with a function between them then we have the following commutative diagram in terms of correspondences. So we have the graph of our function, which is a correspondence from B to A. And here transpose is just for technical reasons because I'm going from B to A, not from A to B. So I hope that doesn't alarm you um, too much. And um, iota B and iota A are the inclusions of each manifold as the zero section of the cotangent bundle. And so here I'm taking the graphs of these inclusions in, uh, uh, in the zero section um, on each of the uh, uh, vertical um, lines. And finally, on top, we have the conormal bundle of the graph of um, our morphism. And so this diagram commutes if you compose these um, correspondences. And um, so this allows us in particular um, to upgrade from our manifolds to their cotangent bundles. 
and um, uh, go beyond functions to more general correspondences, which don't necessarily come as the graphs of functions, um, as well as um, we can factor. So for instance, this um, uh, the conormal bundle, we can factor it into um, other Lagrangians, which are not necessarily conical here. And okay. look, oh uh, yes. It's a, uh, a five minute warning. Okay, thank you. That's uh, great, I think. Good. So, um, so these correspondences, as I mentioned, then induce maps in cohomology, um, uh, which is torus and dilation equivariant, dilation coming from um, working in the cotangent bundles. And uh, in particular, now to understand the pullback on the uh, lower row, uh, it suffices to understand uh, this, uh, uh, the map on the top, which is uh, in this symplectic setting, because now these cotangent bundles are symplectic. In particular, if a class beta goes to a class alpha, um, what happens on the bottom is the class beta divided by the zero section, the class of the zero section goes to the class alpha divided by the class of the zero section. Since we are dividing by zero sections here, uh, we need to work um, in localized um, cohomology. Okay, so um, this is the more general setup. So now um, let me talk about how we go to upgrading this in the context of um, partial flag varieties and Grassmannians more specifically. So, um, so we're working with our cotangent bundle and suppose we have a regular circle action. So one with isolated fixed points. And suppose one of those fixed points is lambda. Then using the stable envelope construction, we get a so-called MO cycle or molecule Kunkov cycle, which is, um, whose class is going to be a generalization of the Schubert class we saw earlier. So this is uh, given by the closure of the bielinitsky birula strata for lambda, which is the um, attracting set for lambda or the conormal bundle, the Bruja or uh, Schubert cell, um, together with some other closures of other BB strata um, indexed by mu, where mu is less than or equal to lambda in Bruja order with some um, non-negative coefficients. And so this gives us a class in the equivariant cohomology of the cotangent bundle. So generalizing the Schubert classes. And remember, because we uh, want to divide by the zero section, it is uh, more natural to consider the segre schwartz mcpherson class, which is the MO class divided by the zero section. And from these SSM classes, we can recover the Schubert classes in the classical Grossmannian picture um, in the following way, where this H bar um, coefficient is uh, just related to the dilation action. Because um, the cotangent bundle homotopy retracts to G mod P, the dilation action is just trivial. And that comes out as a um, variable H bar. But the, um, the moral here is that we can recover the classical picture from these more generalized classes on cotangent bundles, as well as the structure constants. And so for my final slide, um, let me uh, mention our theorem in progress with uh, Knudsen and Zinjustin, um, which um, so uh, is saying that, um, so we want to construct a correspondence between the cotangent bundle of the Grassmannian and the symplectic Grassmannian, which gives us the map we want in cohomology. And in fact, we're able to do so, um, where lambda here is a fixed point. And um, so that gives us the corresponding uh, molecule Kunkov class. And um, um, the first two Lagrangians here are stable envelopes. And um, the last one is a symplectic reduction. And these together with the six vertex R and K matrices um, allow us to get a more generalized puzzle rule. I think I'll stop here and thank you. Thank you very much, Eva. So let's, let's all give Eva a round of applause. Uh, don't forget your emojis. Emojis, round of applause with emojis, excellent. Thank you. Thank you for the beautiful talk. Thank so, you, Yvonne.
So uh, let's uh, move to our final speaker. Uh, where are you? Here you are. Hi, Josh. I'm going to make you a co-host, so you'll be able to share your slides. And I'm going to ask you to unmute yourself, too. Very good. Okay, okay, so you, yeah, we can hear you well. We can also hear your siren. Hopefully, that will go. Uh, <laughs> hello. Um, would, would you like to uh, share your your slides just to make sure that everything is going okay? Yeah. Uh, does uh, the, the perfect? Yeah. Yeah, we can see it very well. That's mm -hmm. good. Okay. Okay. Great. Um, so let's just wait a few minutes uh, before we start. Everyone can take this moment to stretch. stretch. Yeah. <laughs> no, I, I feel like we should do like primary school teachers who like in the middle of the class, they will be like stand up. Like, you yeah, know. that's right. That's right. I think that is a good idea. Yeah. Modern problems call for modern solutions. <laughs> sure. Well, we can implement it next time. Right. So as always, I remind all our participants that uh, although your microphones are muted, um, you don't have to have your camera on. Camera it's, on. It's, 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 a, it, it's a good thing to do to keep your camera on because uh, well, the speaker benefits from it, and other participants also uh, benefit from it. It makes for a kind of much more communal experience. Uh, How are you, Josh? Also. Oh yeah, I'm okay. I'm okay. How are you? Sorry, sorry Nastya, I, I I cut you off. Ah, I was I was trying to say that if it is important for you, if you turn your camera on, it is not streamed on YouTube. Like on YouTube, ah, yes, there is only right. slides and the speaker, so you're not recorded. You are not streamed. Oh yes, that's actually a good point to mention. Yes, uh, Josh, you you are recorded. Yeah, yeah. You are. Yeah. <laughs> so don't, don't... Oh, I, I understood that part. Yeah. Yeah. Don't do anything silly. <laughs> so uh yeah so how are you josh i'm okay i'm okay yeah. i'm uh excited to present excellent excellent that's what i want to hear perfect <laughs> yeah So uh, did you uh, stay up very late by any chance last night finishing your slides or not? Uh, well, not that late, but I didn't sleep super well. So I see. I, that seems to be a trend. This is this seems to be a trend amongst especially the young speakers. Yeah, I, I went to bed like appropriately, but I didn't sleep well. Oh, that's good. Okay. Okay, I think I think probably we can begin. Yeah, it's time. So let me introduce the last speaker for today, uh, Joshua Lackman from University of Toronto, who will speak about generalized Van East map. Okay, so uh, well, thank you for the to the organizers for inviting me uh, to do this. Um, today I'm going to be talking about a uh, generalized Van Est map. So uh, a brief overview. There are several uh, Van S maps in the literature. Roughly, they all involve taking uh, certain geometric structures involving Lie groupoids and mapping them to their in infinitesimal counterparts, which involve Lie algebraids. So to be more precise, I would say a Van S map is a map taking Lie algebraid cohomology, sorry, Lie groupoid cohomology to Lie algebraid cohomology. Um, examples of uh, such geometric structures, which are classified by cohomology, are groupoid representations on line bundles, 
groupoid morphisms into C star, uh, equivariant gerbs, central extension of groupoids, and uh, many others. Uh, the last example is in um, the central extension of groupoids is in particular relevant to the quantization of Poisson manifolds. Um, now, uh, a bit of history. So Van Est uh, originally defined a Van Est map and proved an isomorphism theorem for real Lie group cohomology with coefficients in a representation. Um, later, Weinstein and Shu generalized the Van Est map to real Lie groupoids in their study of symplectic groupoids and quantization in a paper of the same name. And they proved an isomorphism theorem in low degree. Um, so I believe they proved that if the source fibers of the groupoid are simply connected, then you have an isomorphism up to degree one in cohomology uh, between the groupoid cohomology and the Lie algebra cohomology. Um, Krynik uh, later completed the proof of the isomorphism theorem, again for coefficients in a representation. Um, Van Ness maps have since been studied by Abad, Cabrera, Drummond, Meinerkin, and many others. So uh, what, what does this talk about? So we'll discuss the generalization of the Van Ness isomorphism theorem to Lie groupoids with coefficients in more general sheaves, such as O star, which uh, is either the sheaf of uh, C star valued functions, or if you want the sheaf of S1 valued functions. In addition, uh, we'll discuss the generalization to complex Lie groupoids. And this is the archive link to the relevant paper. So uh, the structure of this group of this talk from this point on will be as follows. So first I'll discuss families of abelian groups. These are basically things that you could take uh, cohomology of. Then I'll discuss Lie groupoid cohomology. Then I'll discuss uh, G modules. Then I'll discuss Lie algebraic cohomology. Then I'll discuss the Van Es theorem followed by an application. And then hopefully um, I'll have time to discuss future directions. So uh, let me uh, discuss families of abelian groups now. So uh, let A be an abelian Lie group, then to each manifold X, we have a, a groupoid, which is the Cartesian product of X with A, whose source and target map are just the projection onto A, and such that the multiplication is induced by the multiplication on A. So XA times XB is just XAB. Uh, this is an example of a family of abelian groups, and we denote it by a sub x, and we'll call this the trivial family of abelian groups. Um, so I'll give a fo more formal definition now. So let x be a manifold. A family of groups over x is a Lie groupoid, m mapping to x, such that the source and target maps are equal. A family of groups will be called a family of abelian groups if the multiplication on m induces the structure of an abelian group on its source or target fibers. The sheaf of sections of a family of abelian groups is a sheaf of abelian groups, and we'll denote it by O of M. So here, um, there's only one arrow I put. I just did that because the source and target maps are equal, so just pick, pick whichever one you want. Um, my preferred examples to keep in mind are A equals C star or A equals S1. So in this case, you just get, uh, if you choose A equals C star, then the sheaf you get is just the sheaf of C star valued functions. If you, uh, I mean, in for if you use the trivial family of abelian groups. So if you take X cross C star, that forms a family of abelian groups and the sheaf is the sheaf of C star valued functions. So if you want for the rest of the talk, you just uh, think only about the sheaf of C star valued functions or the sheaf of S1 valued functions and uh, it's fine. So uh, now let's discuss the uh, nerve of a, a Lie groupoid. So I'll denote a Lie groupoid by G mapping to G naught. Now there's a functor which takes uh, Lie groupoids to simplicial manifolds uh, denoted G to B bullet G. So this is just taking the nerve of the groupoid. So in degree zero, it's just G naught. In degree one, it's G, the space of morphisms. And in degree N, it's the space of N composable arrows. Uh, so for n equals one, the face maps are just the source and target maps. And then for all other n, uh, the face maps are given by these formulas. Uh, they look a bit cumbersome, but they're, they're not 
they're they're fine. Um, and so the first um, face map is just dropping the first component. The final face map is just dropping the final component. And in all other degrees, face maps just do a pairwise composition. So uh, here I'm composing G I minus one with G I. Now, um, given an abelian Lie group A, we can define the cohomology of G with coefficients in A to be the cohomology of the simplicial manifold BG, where on B and G, we put the sheaf of A valued functions. Um, so our remark, sheaves on simplicial manifolds have enough injectives. So the cohomology is just defined uh, as usual. You take an injective resolution and then there's a global sections functor and uh, you do it like that. Um, so in degree zero, this cohomology classifies invariant functions on G naught taking values in A. Um, so to see this, um, the, the, in degree zero, um, it should give you the, uh, it's the global sections functor applied to the sheaf. And um, the global sections functor is just taking sections on the base, global sections on the base, which such that if there's an arrow between two points in the base, then the function evaluates the same thing on these two points. And uh, in degree one, this cohomology classifies G equivariant principal A bundles on G naught, which you might call a principal A bundle on G or the stack. And in degree two, this cohomology, cohomology classifies G equivariant gerbs on G naught, which you might call gerb on the group board or the stack. Um, so now I'll discuss uh, G modules. So instead of taking cohomology with respect to A valued functions or with respect to the sheaf of A valued functions, we can take cohomology with respect to a family of abelian groups M as long as G acts on M, which would make it into a G module. So G modules are a generalization of group board representations where instead of the fibers being vector spaces, they are abelian groups. Um, so here's a definition two gave in one of his papers. Um, let G of A, B be the space of morphisms with source A and target B. A G module M mapping to G naught is a family of abelian groups such that uh, together with an action of G on M such that the space of morphisms between A and B act by homomorphisms on the fibers of M over A and B. So here M sub A, M sub B are the fibers of M over A and B respectively. Um, so I, again, if you want, you could just think of, uh, just think of C star um, and the action is trivial. So let me see, can you, uh, okay, I'll say that for later. Um, so yeah, if you want, you could just think of uh, the sheaf of C star valid functions or S1 valid functions and everything uh, is good. Um, those are very important examples. Now, not all uh, G modules are fiber bundles. So this is why I called them, or yeah, I, I'm i calling them families of abelian groups and not bundles of abelian groups because they're not necessarily a fiber bundle. And a nice example of a G module, which isn't a fiber bundle is what we call a C star X star D. This is a G module whose sheaf of sections is isomorphic to the sheaf of meromorphic functions value in C star with poles and zeros only allowed on the divisor D. Um, so I, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not saying exactly what it is or what even the groupoid which is acting is, but um, the, the important, most important part I think is that the sheaf of sections of this G module is the sheaf of meromorphic functions. Um, later, I'll uh, expound on that a bit, hopefully. So now I'll discuss uh, Lie algebraic cohomology. Um, so let G uh, mapping to X be a Lie algebraic and let A be a, an abelian Lie group with exponential map uh, frac A to A. We then define sheaves on X called sheaves of A valued forms as follows. In degree zero, it's just the sheaf of A valued functions. And in all other degrees, it's just forms 
on the Lie algebra are taking values in frac A. So if big A is C, if B, big A is uh, say S1, then this is just, then in degree zero, it would just be S1 valued functions and, and all of the degrees, it's just uh, forms on the Lie algebra, real valued ones. So um, as they're usually defined. Now, uh, given a local section F uh, taking values in A, the log of F isn't well defined. However, DCE of log F is, where DCE is the Chevalier Eilenberg differential. So we then have a cochain complex of sheaves given by uh, the following. Um, so I didn't say what the Chevalier Eilenbergs are, uh, differences are, but they're, if you don't know, they're basically a generalization of the Durham differentials. The sheaf cohomology of the above complex of sheaves is known by H star frac G A. Now, um, an example of this is de Link homology. So if in the previous slide, we let uh, frac G be the tangent bundle of X and we let A equals uh, B C star, then the cochain complex we get is the following. So here, uh, omega one X C is uh, one forms, Duram one forms valued in C, omega two X C is uh, differential two forms valued in, in C. In degree one, this cohomology classifies complex line bundles with a flat connection. Um, now the initial integration by which I mean the source simply connected integration of the tangent bundle is the fundamental groupoid. So a Van S theorem stated in the right context should tell you when a line bundle with a flat connection integrates to a representation of the fundamental groupoid. And um, the answer is always. Basically this is because um, the source fibers, if they're simply connected, then you get an isomorphism in degree one. And I'll explain more about that later. So now I'll discuss the uh, Van Ness map. So there's a map um, from Lie groupoid cohomology to Lie algebraic cohomology called the Van Ness map. I'm not gonna say exactly what it is because it's a bit involved um, in my parallel talk. I'll talk more about it, but it has some important properties. Um, so if the source fibers of uh, the groupoid are N connected, then this map is an isomorphism up to degree N and injective in degree N plus one. Now, uh, given a source fiber of the groupoid, there's a translation map, which takes a class in Lie algebra cohomology to a class in cohomology of the source fiber. So in the case that uh, the class in Lie algebraic cohomology is given by uh, a form, it's like an N form on the Lie algebra, then this translation map is just doing a right translation of the form to a fiberwise uh, differential form on the groupoid. Um, but not all classes in the Lie algebraic cohomology are given by differential forms. So um, in general, it's it's similar, but slightly more complicated than that. But the point is that if the source fibers of the groupoid are N connected, then a class in degree N plus one in Lie algebra cohomology is in the image of the Van Est map, if and only if the translation of this class to each source fiber is trivial. Um, so, so that means here, Basically, if you know the fibers are N connected, then you have a way of computing the uh, cohomology of the groupoid up to degree N plus one. In higher degrees, it doesn't tell you anything. Um, so if the fibers are one are simply connected, then it, you can compute the cohomology up to degree two, but in degree three, it the theorem doesn't tell you anything. Um, so here's an application. Let X of uh, let X pi be a log symplectic complex manifold with smooth zero locus uh, given by you. So pi here is a Poisson structure, and you raise it to the power of n, and the zero locus is all points on which the Poisson structure vanishes. 
So um, if you don't know what that means, basically pi is a holomorphic uh, Poisson structure such that the inverse of pi is a two form with possible logarithmic singularities on D and which is symplectic away from the divisor. So an example of this is uh, given by uh, pi equals x del x y del y on x is equal to c2. And here the divisor is all the points where pi vanishes, which is just when x is equal to zero. Now, uh, suppose that pi inverse has integral periods on x minus d. So on, on x minus d, pi inverse is a uh, nice, is a perfectly good two form. And we're supposing that it has integral periods there. Then if g omega is a source simply connected symplectic groupoid integrating the Poisson manifold x pi, then omega is pre-quantizable to a C star extension of G. So if you don't know what that means, um, what I mean is that if, um, if, pi, if pi inverse has integral periods on the complement of the divisor, then there is a uh, line bundle over the groupoid, which has a multiplication on it, which is compatible with the multiplication on the groupoid and such that the curvature of this line bundle is omega. This is essentially what I mean. So this is a uh, pre-quantization result for Poisson manifolds. Now, um, I'd like to discuss some future directions um, that I've been working on with Francis Bischoff. Um, so I don't want to get too much into double Lie groupoids, but I'll try to explain why a souped up version of the Van Nest map is desired. One which takes the cohomology of a double Lie groupoid to the cohomology of its Lie algebra groupoid. Um, so let me show you some diagrams. So a double Lie groupoid looks like this. So essentially you have a G is G1. This is a groupoid over both G1 naught and G. And then G1 naught is a groupoid over G naught and G is a groupoid over G naught as well. So this is called a double groupoid. Um, you could think of it as a Lie groupoid in the category of Lie groupoids. Basically how I think of it is on the top row, you have this groupoid. And I think of this as being a groupoid over the groupoid on the bottom row. Row. Now you can differentiate this and you get something like this. It's a Lie algebra groupoid. So you could think of this as a, uh, so G1 mapping to G is a Lie algebra, G1 not mapping to G not is a Lie algebra. And you could think of this as a Lie algebra in the category of Lie groupoids. Um, or you can think of it as a Lie groupoid in the category of Lie algebraids. And now the cohomology, so I'm not gonna um, say exactly how to define it, but uh, the cohomology of a Lie algebra groupoid is something which basically mixes Lie algebra cohomology with Lie groupoid cohomology. Um, it's not much more complicated than the cohomology of a groupoid though. Now, why would we want this? So uh, Van Nest originally computed Lie group cohomology of a group G exactly in all degrees using a relative Lie algebra cohomology uh, relative with respect to Lie algebra cohomology of the maximal compact subgroup. So basically, instead of considering all forms on the Lie algebra, he considers a subcomplex of forms which vanish on Lie, Lie algebra of the maximal compact subgroup. Now, uh, the Vanis theorem that I stated above only gives cohomology up to degree n plus one if the source fibers are n connected. So, in all high, higher degrees, it doesn't tell you anything about the cohomology of the groupoid. Um, but Vanest was able to compute it in all degrees um, in a slightly different way. Now, um, I'm going to say something which is a bit 
uh, vague, um, but it can be made precise. So maybe it's a bit philosophical. Uh, so I would say the algebra cohomology of frac G. So now I'm just, everything I'm saying will generalize to groupoids, but I just want to focus on the algebras for now. Um, the algebra cohomology of frac G is like uh, the fibroized Durham cohomology of the identity mapping into G. Um, given a subgroup, H mapping into G, the fibers of the inclusion are groupoid with classifying space EG cross G mod H. Um, Josh, uh, a five minute warning for you. Okay, thank you. Uh, let me, oh, I think I figured out how to, let me, uh, I just wanna see if I could write something. Okay, so you could see that, yeah, right? Yes. Yes, yes. Okay, so let, me, let me just say, since I have time, let me just say what uh, the group board, let me talk more about the fibers because they're not the fibers as spaces. So there's a, you know, if you have a map between spaces, there's a definition of fibers. But um, if you have a map between groupoids, there's also a definition of fibers and it generalizes the definition of fibers of spaces, but it's not the exact same. So for a, a uh, subgroup H mapping to G, the fibers, if I recall correctly, are an action groupoid. H, well, H action G. So this is a groupoid over G. Uh, sorry for the writing. Um, it's a groupoid over G. So H here acts by uh, translation. And these are the fibers of the inclusion map. And the classifying space of this groupoid is EG cross G mod H. Now, let me uh, just erase this. Uh, so to get Van Est original result, we need to compute the uh, fibrized Durham cohomology of K mapping to G, where K is the maximal compact subgroup of G. So to be more precise, this is the cohomology of a Lie algebraid groupoid associated to K mapping to G. Um, to make this uh, slightly less vague, um, the, the Lie algebraid groupoid associated to K mapping to G can be thought of uh, as the normal bundle of K inside G with some additional structure. So like if K is the point, then, then the Lie algebraid groupoid is, is, a, is just a Lie algebra. And it's just the normal bundle of the identity inside the group with some extra structure. So when I say Lie algebra group right here, you could sort of imagine normal bundle and it's, it's somewhat true. Now, um, it's a fact that the, max, the, the inclusion of the maximal compact subgroup of a group inside G is a weak homotopy equivalence of spaces. Um, thus, its fiber is weakly contractible because its classifying space is given by EG cross G mod K. So um, remember the fiber of K mapping to G is the, the classifying space of this fiber is EG cross G mod K. And since K mapping to G is a weak homotopy equivalence, it follows from the Serre spectral sequence that EG cross G mod K is weakly contractible. And this implies that the cohomology of Lie algebra groupoid is isomorphic to the cohomology of G in all degrees. So this is kind of like the cohomology of the normal bundle of K inside G is the cohomology of the Lie group. And uh, this implies Van Est's original result. And uh, that's that's basically all I wanted to say. Okay, thank you very much, Josh, for a wonderful talk. So that was the last talk of uh, our session. Let's give Josh uh, a, a nice round of applause, including emojis. Everyone should use their emojis. Thank you. <laughs> Excellent. Uh, thank you very much. Um, okay, so uh, now we move on to the parallel session um, 
part, uh, uh, part of this uh, Western Hemisphere session. <laughs> um, so just to remind you, so so all the speakers are split into four different rooms. Uh, so uh, Maxime is, uh, goes to room one, Peter goes to room two, Eva goes to room three, and Josh goes to room four. So all the rooms have already been opened. Um, the links are in the conference package. Uh, this uh, main lecture room will remain open. So if, um, and I'll keep an eye on it. So if you have any questions or anything, you can always come back here and uh, ask me directly. Uh, see you all in one of the rooms. See you. Hi Lisa. Do you need do you need some help? Don't please, uh, you need to unmute yourself, sorry. Hi, yes. Hi. I, I clicked the wrong thing. I'm just trying to get to room two. Okay. Which uh, I'll be able to do. Hi. Okay. 